Okay, thanks. So, uh, yesterday we have introduced uh, the general technique of uh, toposis as uh, bridges. Uh, today, I would like uh, to give uh, some specific uh, examples of bridges from arising in different areas of mathematics and across <laughs> different areas of mathematics. But uh, before uh, uh, presenting these uh, examples, I would like just to say uh, a few more words um, of, uh, I would like to give some general remarks. Uh, yeah, my head is like, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, I would like just to make a few uh, more general remarks before uh, going uh, um, towards the, the examples. Okay, so yesterday we remarked that the fact that um, the expression of a given topos theoretic invariance in terms of different presentations, in particular in terms of different sites for um, a given topos, uh, can be interpreted as a sort of mathematical morphogenesis in the sense that we have a unit, a unity which lies at uh, the topos theoretic level and uh, different uh, concrete manifestations of this unity um, in uh, different uh, concrete contexts uh, represented by uh, the presentations. Okay, so um, th there is a, a an analogy that uh, has been uh, made between uh, uh, this um, uh, methodology of topos as bridges and the well-known uh, Erlangen uh, program, uh, which, um, in fact, uh, it was uh, André Joyal that made that uh, remark, that we can regard uh, this methodology as, uh, as a vast extension of uh, Klein's Erlangen program. So here are a few points uh, to explain in which sense the, this, uh, this, uh, this analogy works. Well, uh, uh, in fact, um, uh, first of all, we have to observe that there is a very natural relationship between groups and toposes. So given a group, uh, for simplicity, a discrete group, the category of actions of this group on uh, sets is, uh, is a topos. Of course, this can be generalized uh, to any uh, topological group or um, even a localic group. <laughs> but if you just stick to discrete groups, uh, you realize that this uh, way of assigning toposes to groups really allow one to uh, regard a topos as a generalization of a discrete group. Um, so, uh, you see, what Klein uh, did in, uh, in his program is uh, to introduce this idea of uh, understanding geometries through the associated uh, automorphism groups. And so, what we do here is uh, something uh, perfectly analogous. We study first-order geometric theories uh, through the associated classifying toposes and through the invariance that we can consider on these classifying toposes. And uh, so, this uh, program uh, turned out to, to be very successful in uh, establishing relations uh, between uh, different looking geometries through um, the analysis of uh, the algebraic properties of these uh, automorphisms, uh, automorphism groups. So uh, it is natural to expect uh, a similar impact uh, brought by uh, the methodology of uh, toposis as, uh, as bridges. Okay, so um, this is just a sort of a general uh, remark. Then I would like to make uh, another uh, general observation uh, about the kind of translations that uh, are made possible by these uh, bridges. Because really we can interpret this uh, methodology as uh, a sort of technique for translating ideas, notions and results from one theory or one presentation to another. But then, uh, if you uh, think in uh, linguistic terms, um, you, you realize that uh, there are uh, different approaches that you can have for translating things uh, from one context to another. So um, the first reaction the when that one uh, might have when one has to translate something is to look for a dictionary. So yesterday we have talked about by interpretations, which represent the logical formalization of the idea of a dictionary. So uh, if the languages are sufficiently near each other, then a dictionary will suffice. So one can adopt what I call there a dictionary-oriented approach to translation. So this means that uh, when you have your text, uh, you split uh, your text into elementary components, 
which can be words or short, uh, short expressions. And then through the dictionary, you look on the other side if there is uh, some short expression, uh, some basic constituent on the other hand, which will correspond. And this uh, is uh, uh, what should govern your translation. Of course, uh, this is uh, uh, an idea that is applicable in a uh, certain uh, amount of situations, but if you think uh, about uh, translations across uh, different languages, like uh, for instance between uh, uh, English and Japanese, or I mean languages that really have uh, uh, significantly different uh, syntactic ways uh, for conveying a given meaning, you realize that the dictionaries uh, uh, no longer suffice. And so the right way to think about uh, translations is really really through uh, invariance. So basically, uh, a good translator should fix at the outset the kind of uh, information, the kind of properties that he wants to remain fixed, to remain invariant under the translation process, and then he should adapt uh, the, the, the translation uh, according to this. So basically the invariants uh, are put at the very center of the stage uh, in a proper translation and then uh, given an invariant what the, the, the translator most unconsciously does uh, is to look uh, at uh, how this invariant, which uh, I mean the main invariant is the meaning but it is not uh, the only one of course uh, you see if you have to translate uh, poetry for instance you have to take into account not just the meaning but also the rhythmic or the musicality of the text and so on. So these will be the invariants and uh, they will tell you how to perform the translation. So they will be at the center of the bridge and then for each of these invariants, we will look at how they express on one side and on the other side. And so this is how you will perform the translation. So this is just a metaphor to, uh, to explain how uh, we do things uh, also in, uh, in the topospheretic setting. And uh, as you can see, the invariant-oriented approach is much more flexible because it allows a given meaning, a, a given content to be expressible in completely different ways. So we, we don't preserve the syntax, we preserve the universal semantics. So it's very important uh, to keep in mind that here we are working at uh, two levels and uh, we cannot identify, we cannot flatten the two into just one. We have to, ca to keep the two levels uh, separate, syntax and the universal semantics, uh, which is embodied by the toposes. Okay. And uh, the key point is that uh, a given content, a given semantics, uh, can be uh, described, can be approached by different points of view, different languages, and so there is this uh, morphogenesis going on. Okay, so another point which uh, seems to me uh, quite uh, important to mention in relation with um, toposes and uh, their use um, as bridges is the idea of completion. So a topos of sheaves on a site uh, really uh, is a form of completion of the site. Uh, completion by addition of uh, certain uh, uh, objects uh, which we can think of as imaginaries in the model theoretic sense. So a, an imaginary is uh, like you take uh, a formal coproduct and then a quotient by an inter a definable equivalence relation. So basically every object of uh, a topos of sheaves on, uh, on a site can be uh, represented in, in this way. So you see, you, you can always go from uh, the category to the topos by going uh, first through the pre-shift topos by means of the unit embedding, and then you have the associated shift factor. So this factor was denoted L, okay? And uh, so of course, in general, uh, L will not be fully faithful. So you shouldn't think of this as a completion in the uh, strict sense of the word, uh, in the sense that uh, it is an enlargement. It, 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 doesn't, uh, uh, it isn't necessarily the case. It is the case if and only if uh, the topology J is a subcanonical. Okay? And it's very important that uh, for, the, for the richness of uh, the theory of growth and ictoposis that uh, not all growth and ictopologies are subcanonical. There are many important 
growth in dict topologies that uh, are not. Uh, but uh, even uh, when uh, you don't have subcanonicities, you can still regard this as a completion because uh, basically the site is uh, something which generates this topos, and in order to obtain the topos from the site, uh, you really add things. So you take formal coproducts and uh, quotients by uh, internal equivalence relations in the sense of uh, uh, topos. Okay, so uh, basically this uh, tells us a lot about uh, how we should think um, uh, about uh, uh, toposes and uh, their, uh, their relationships with the theories and sites. So basically the idea is, uh, you see, when you have a theory or a site, you should think of that as uh, something incomplete, a sort of sketch, it's just a sort of a presentation, sketchy presentation of a certain content, which will be materialized when you go to the corresponding topos. So basically, you see, as I wrote there, uh, this completion by the addition of imaginaries materializes the potential contained, like the potential implicit in the site or the theory. So, and this duality is, of course, very interesting because, uh, okay, you, uh, you add and uh, you materialize all the information, if you want, by building the topos, but, of course, uh, the price you have to pay for that is that uh, a topos is an object that is much more complicated, much richer than, than a site. So, making computations is much easier at this level, but understanding invariance can be uh, I mean, invariants, of course, live at the level of the toposes. But uh, if, you, um, uh, if you consider toposes of shifts on a site, and the site is uh, relatively simple, then you can hope to understand a complicated invariant in relatively simple and concrete terms when you try to uh, study it in the context of the site. So it's important, really, to... Um, uh, to, to exploit uh, this duality between the two levels, uh, because uh, this level has the advantage of being uh, concrete and uh, small, manageable, quite combinatorial. The level of toposes has the advantage of uh, the fact that invariants are naturally defined here, and because of the very rich categorical structures, when you want to perform computations, it is much easier to perform them here, because in most cases, uh, you see, sites will not be, in general, closed with respect to all the categorical operations you, you might want to perform, such as quotients, as Laurent Laforgue has explained <laughs> in his uh, lectures, or uh, coproducts, or whatever. So you see, the idea is uh, you start with something, uh, with a sort of fragment, then you complete it, you, uh, you work in this extended fragment, and then you try maybe to understand uh, the meaning of your calculations from the concrete point of view uh, you have started uh, with, or maybe from another concrete point of view provided by an alternative site of definition or an, an alternative presentation for the topos you have. So here I have uh, written this uh, scheme which uh, summarizes a little bit uh, how uh, we can um, implement this bridge technique. So uh, basically, in most cases, you start with something quite concrete. You are interested in a concrete mathematical problem, uh, you, and then you try to build a topos uh, which uh, uh, embodies some essence, to use Grothendieck's word, of the situation you want to investigate. So you try to capture, by means of a topos, uh, some features of the problem you want to investigate. So in this way, you go at the topos level. But then, uh, of course, you would like to get out of that, because in the end, uh, you want to get concrete results. And so uh, the idea uh, is uh, to, to look for alternative presentations for the same topos and, uh, um, and, mm, and to consider invariance uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, these other presentations. And in this way, you will get many other concrete results which will be related uh, uh, to uh, the, mm, 
uh, to your uh, concrete uh, fact uh, from which you started. And in general, I would like to emphasize that uh, there will be no direct deduction. Uh, I mean, in principle, of course, uh, yes, in the sense that you can eliminate formally toposis. After all, toposis are defined in terms of site, and of course, uh, tautologically, it is possible. But in practice, uh, the relationships that you will get uh, will uh, be very hard to understand uh, without passing to the topos. Of course, this all depends on the complexity of invariance you consider, on the sophistication of the situation, but uh, I hope to uh, convince you uh, through the examples that I shall present uh, that uh, even with uh, very basic invariance, you can get very surprising uh, connections, very surprising translations uh, between uh, different properties that uh, would have been very hard to imagine without uh, these tools uh, and even uh, after they, they, they have been discovered uh, um, hard to prove. Okay, so now um, let's go to, mm, to some uh, analysis of uh, examples. So I will discuss uh, miscellaneous uh, uh, collection of, um, of uh, bridges in uh, different areas. So I will uh, first show that uh, Galois theory actually can be interpreted as a topospheretic bridge and that uh, this way of interpreting Galois theory through bridges leads naturally to significant generalizations which uh, in particular uh, subsume uh, uh, growth index theory of uh, Galois categories. Then I will talk about uh, a very important class of theories, uh, the class of theories of pre-shift type. Uh, the definition is just a theory classified by a pre-shift topos. These theories are uh, very, very important because in a sense they are the basic building blocks from which uh, we can uh, uh, construct any, any geometric theory. And uh, they also provide us uh, with a good opportunity to test the bridge technique because every theory of pre-shift types uh, of pre-shift type uh, naturally comes uh, uh, equipped with um, uh, two distinctly uh, different. Uh, yes, somebody should. Ah, okay. Uh, so when you have a theory of pre-shift type, uh, it comes equipped with. Um, uh, two significantly different uh, descriptions of the classifying topos, so it will give us an opportunity to see uh, bridges in, uh, in action. Uh, then I will talk about the quotients of theories of pre-shift type and the correspondence with uh, topologies, uh, Grothendieck topologies on uh, suitable categories. Then I will talk about uh, a topospheretic uh, general uh, generalization of Fry's theory in, in uh, model theory, which uh, actually will uh, uh, be strictly connected with uh, the Galois type um, uh, framework uh, that, I, that I mentioned. In fact, uh, the two uh, theories, Galois theory on one end and Fry's theory on the other, will be uh, interpreted as a sort of two faces of the same coin. So they will be quite unified using the, the topospheretic viewpoint. So basically, uh, the toposes which are involved in both uh, uh, theories are toposes of the same kind. They are atomic to valued toposes. And uh, the link with Galois is provided by the consideration of group theoretic representations for these toposes, while uh, the link with Freyse is uh, provided by the consideration of syntactic representations for these toposes. So you see uh, we are uh, at uh, the, the, the core of uh, this technique and this allows uh, one in particular to, uh, to, to unify these uh, two apparently uh, different uh, theories. Then I will uh, briefly mention uh, the subject of uh, stone type uh, dualities uh, to illustrate that uh, we can interpret uh, most of these dualities as naturally arising from topospheretic uh, bridges. Then I will also discuss uh, uh, the topic of uh, a topic which I have investigated with uh, my former PhD uh, student uh, Anna Carla Russo, uh, the relation between uh, uh, MV algebras and uh, lattice ordered abelian groups. This is a subject which uh, is uh, very interesting to understand from a topospheretic viewpoint because it is uh, rich of dualities um, which are uh, by no means uh, trivial and which have played an important role in uh, the developments um, 
uh, in that area. And in fact, the example of uh, a pair of Morita equivalent theories, which are not by interpretable, which I mentioned yesterday, uh, in fact, uh, belongs uh, to those works. So I will describe this example um, later in, uh, in, uh, in the course. Okay, so what I would like to emphasize, of course, uh, these are by no means uh, all the uh, bridges that have been obtained before, but it is just a brief uh, selection to give you uh, an idea and uh, of course I will give uh, references at uh, the end if you want to, to know more. So wha what I would like to stress is that you see here uh, we are talking about results in uh, quite different areas of mathematics but in fact the, the methodology obtained to derive these results is just one. So you see this uh, indicates uh, the creative power of toposphere. Really I mean Laurent Laforgue has already stressed this fact that the toposphere guide you. Uh, if you take them seriously enough, uh, you will feel naturally guided to introduce new notions, to think in a certain way, and um, and, and so, uh, even with just a few basic principles in mind, uh, you can prove uh, results that would be hardly accessible by using uh, traditional techniques. Okay, so now I start with the first, uh, yes, Um, I, I would want to make a personal suggestion. Uh, yes. <laughs> would it be possible for you maybe to change the order? Uh, yes, the if you beca want. Because uh, I have already heard uh, talks by you on the okay. different subjects, uh -huh. except the last one. Ah, okay. <laughs> which I think is particularly interesting, okay. just for the reason you said yeah. that uh, it gives a, a natural okay, example. So let's, uh, of, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So let's go on the on this. Yeah, no, but uh, I will try to be maybe shorter on the others. But uh, no, I wanted to start with Galois theory because I know that some people are not familiar with logic. So that was my reason for putting that at the beginning. But uh, okay, no problem with that. Okay, so um, basically here. Uh, so the equivalence I was referring to uh, for NV algebras is uh, Mundich's equivalence between uh, the category of NV algebras and uh, the category of L groups with a strong unit. So what are we talking about? NV algebras are algebraic structures. So an NV algebra is just uh, a set equipped with um, a binary operation, a unary operation and uh, zero, satisfying uh, a list of axioms. So you require uh, this uh, binary operation to be associated. Ah, I can write, okay, yes. So uh, plus uh, is uh, uh, commutative, associative, then uh, you have uh, uh, this property, uh, then you have uh, that property, then there is a strange uh, property here. Yeah, so. And then uh, you also have that. Okay, so this is a NV algebra. So how should you think about that? So an NV algebra is uh, the natural analog of a Boolean algebra for Lukasiewicz uh, infinite valued logic. So multivalued, multivalued, yes. Yes, so basically the, the way you traditionally construct uh, NV algebras is through <laughs> L groups uh, with strong unit. Because this uh, is really quite, um, you see, weird uh, apparently as a notion because uh, this uh, uh, operation here is a truncated sum. So basically uh, you start with uh, R, which is uh, a, so first maybe I should give just the formal definition of an L group with strong unit. So, ah, yes, please. Ah, sorry, uh, zero, uh, no. <laughs> no, in fact, one is just this, is, uh, yeah. 
Ok. Um, so, um, so yes, so uh, an L group with a uh, strong uh, unit is, uh, so an L group, a lattice ordered abelian group, so it means that it is an abelian group with a partial order which is compatible with addition and uh, uh, the partial order induces a lattice structure. Yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, g, g, u, so you have, uh, well, g with, uh, so this is uh, lattice, uh, well, abelian, abelian group with uh, a partial order uh, which uh, gives uh, a lattice structure. And uh, this order is uh, compatible uh, with respect to addition, so there is the translation uh, invariance property that uh, if uh, you have that, then... Okay. For each T. Um, and uh, so the, the, the concept of a strong unit um, is um, this. So a strong unit is a, is a positive element such that uh, any X, uh, well, let's suppose it positive, uh, is less than or equal to an integer multiple of a natural multiple of the, um, of the unit mm? for, some, for some n. So look at uh, the formalization of this notion in geometric logic. Here, you see, we cannot write there exists an n because we are in first order logic and we don't want to talk about natural numbers. So the way to express this is uh, by taking an infinitary disjunction, which will be like that. So you see, we will have a geometric sequence which uh, says that, uh, uh, well, like that. Uh, okay, so this uh, sequence uh, will express uh, the property of a strong unit. So you see that uh, the theory of NV algebras, the axioms are all algebraic. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a lattice structure in the sense of an order or in the sense of a finite rank free abelian group? It is of, of the order. I mean, with respect to the order, it is a lattice, so it means that it has uh, a finitary inf and sup and, uh, yeah. Okay, so you see, these two theories are quite different from the point of view of the syntax, because here I have just equations, so this is a uh, finitary algebraic theory, while here we have uh, an infinitary disjunction. And in spite of that, uh, we have uh, an equivalence, as Mundici proved, uh, between the categories of set-based models of these two theories. So the correspondence works in this way. If you start with uh, a, 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 an L group with strong unit, you associate uh, an NV algebra by uh, considering the unit interval. Okay, so, the uh, so it means uh, you take uh, the, the, the elements which uh, are uh, between uh, zero and the unit. And uh, the way you define uh, these operations, so this will be, as I said, the truncated sum. So it will be the inf between u and, uh, uh, because you see, I want to remain inside this interval. So I have to truncate. Uh, I take the sum uh, x plus y, but then I have to take the inf, and I can do it because uh, I have a lattice structure. And uh, this is just uh, 1 minus x. Okay, uh, so you see, for instance, uh, you can take r. r is an example of, uh, and then uh, 0, 1 is, uh, in some sense, the canonical example of an NV algebra. So if you want to understand whether uh, a certain identity, a certain algebraic identity holds in uh, the theory of NV algebras, you just have to check that it holds in that particular uh, model, okay, which is uh, generating the, the variety. Uh, okay, so what is interesting uh, for us about that is that, um, okay, I have described the function going in, uh, the, in this direction. The functor going in the other direction is more complicated. It shows that basically you can reconstruct, uh, let's take in the case of R, I can reconstruct R from the unit interval by taking sequences 
okay, uh, of, uh, of elements. And uh, uh, basically, it turns out that this description uh, just involves um, uh, finite limits and colimits. So it is a geometric construction. And of course, uh, this uh, functor here, which is called the gamma functor, is also geometric. And therefore, uh, we, um, we have that the functors defining this uh, equivalence by Mundici are uh, both geometric and, uh, in fact, uh, they don't require um, any non-constructive principles to be defined. So this shows, by the remark I made yesterday, that uh, the uh, equivalence holding at the level of the set-based models lifts to a Morita equivalence. Okay, now, what is interesting about that is that these two theories are not bi-interpretable. So, um, I will now uh, ex explain why <laughs> this is the case. So, so you see, when you have uh, Morita equivalence without bi-interpretability, many <laughs> quite... Uh, surprising, at least from a concrete point of view, um, many surprising phenomena, uh, can arise. <laughs> For instance, you see, since uh, these two theories, LU and uh, let's call the other one MV, so these are Morita. Um, so it means that uh, the classifying toposes are equivalent. And so you can look at it uh, at invariance uh, from one side and on the other. So one of the simplest uh, invariants you can consider is the notion of a subtopos, which has been introduced in the courses. And uh, so if you take a subtopos, so uh, you will have uh, on this uh, hand the quotients of this in the language of uh, L groups with strong unit, and here I will have the quotients of MV. And look, uh, uh, the this is just a consequence of a theory I proved in my thesis, which says that the subtoposes of the classifying topos of a geometric theory are in natural bijection with, uh, the, um, with the geometric quotients of the, of the theory. Mm? So the signature remains the same, you just add more geometric axioms. And you see that uh, such a result, uh, the fact that, uh, you see, from this bridge, we can uh, conclude that uh, there is a bijective correspondence between uh, the quotients on one side and the quotients on the other. Look, this result would be completely trivial if we had the bi-interpretability, which I recall uh, is uh, this uh, statement, uh, that when you take the geometric syntactic categories, you have uh, an equivalence between them, okay? So this was the formalization of the notion of a dictionary. So to any formula on this side correspond to a formula on the other side and, uh, okay. So you see, if we had that, of course, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this result would be completely trivial. Because, of course, you see, when you have a quotient on uh, one hand, so it means uh, you, you have axioms on this side, and then uh, to each formula you make correspond another formula, and uh, so there is, uh, it's not surprising at all. It becomes quite surprising <laughs> when you don't have by interpretability. It seems im even impossible, <laughs> you see, because uh, you wonder how, how it can be the case. In fact, it is the case, but uh, so in our paper, we have described uh, uh, a process for translating, uh, for, I mean, uh, a process for describing this correspondence, but it is non-trivial, and it is much more subtle than <laughs> in the situation where, where you have a dictionary. So now, let me explain why we don't have by interpretability. Well, basically, it's a matter of size, because, uh, you see, if you take uh, MV algebras, there are uh, quite small MV algebras, but uh, the L groups corresponding to them tend to be very big, okay? So it is this uh, size issue which is responsible uh, for uh, the lack of uh, by interpretation. But uh, let, let's be more formal. So let's uh, suppose uh, that we have uh, a by interpretation, so that we have an equivalence between uh, the syntactic categories. 
So uh, yesterday we uh, mentioned how to, uh, to identify models with functors, with geometric functors defined on the syntactic category. So, so suppose uh, we have uh, J, a, a, by a by interpretation. So uh, we can uh, obtain by composing with J, a functor which goes like that. So here I just compose with, um, with J. Ah, sorry, in the other side, yeah. Uh, sorry. Okay. Okay, yesterday we saw that this is just MV algebras in, uh, in sets. And these are just uh, L, U, mod, set. So these are just uh, the L, uh, L groups with strong unit in, uh, in the category of sets. Okay, and uh, so here we have uh, completed this to a commutative diagram. And so let's call uh, this uh, induced uh, functor S of uh, J. Of course, uh, since uh, this uh, is, um, is an equivalence, uh, this will also be an equivalence. So let's consider certain MV algebra M and the corresponding uh, L group. So let's uh, call it N. Um, then uh, you remember that uh, this um, uh, correspondence worked in this way. So M was uh, sent to F of M and then N is sent to F of N. And so uh, the commutativity of uh, this uh, diagram implies that F of N, ah, sorry, is uh, F of N is uh, isomorphic to um, uh, F of M composed with J. Do you remember how these uh, functors defined on syntactic categories were defined in terms of the models? They were just evaluation functors which took a formula and assigned to that the interpretation of that formula in the model. Okay. So now we take uh, as, um, as a formula in, uh, uh, in, the, in the language of um, LU groups uh, just uh, true, formula true in uh, the variable x. And then uh, we know that uh, j of this formula will be a geometric formula uh, in the language of MV algebras. So I call it like this, uh, psi uh, in the context uh, y. And notice that this context is finite because of uh, the construction of the syntactic category. This is a key point, okay? Now, we evaluate uh, this uh, at this uh, formula. So, we, we take that, uh, and we know by definition of f of n that this is just n. We are in a one-sorted language, so this is just n. It is the underlying set of uh, uh, the L group corresponding to M. But because of that, I can calculate this in another way. So this becomes F of M of that. But this, by definition of F of M, is just the interpretation of that in M. But this, you remember yesterday I told you that when you interpret a formula, this will be a sub-object of the product of the interpretation of the sorts uh, arising in this context. This is a finitary context, and I have just one sort, so it will be a sub-object of, of n for a certain n. Okay? So, look, we have that n should be contained in that. And uh, you see, now, uh, suppose that M is finite. We have many MV algebras that are finite. So you can take uh, uh, 
gamma of uh, Z with M, and in this way you obtain many MV algebras that are finite. Now, uh, so you see this implies that uh, N should be finite, but the only L group uh, which is finite is the trivial one. So you see here, I, I can have uh, that for one M <laughs> I get the trivial one, but if for different M that are non-isomorphic I obtain the same result, this contradicts the fact that this functor S of J is an equivalence because if it is an equivalence, it uh, reflects isomorphisms. So we have reached the contradiction. Okay, so we have showed that, so you see it's uh, quite simple, but uh, it is quite uh, revealing of the quite different, uh, uh, yes, please. Sorry, uh, I was just wondering how one might be um, in, well, interested in, in these uh, L groups or, or um, MF algebras, they seem quite technical. You mentioned something about... No, in fact, uh, there is a connection with logic. Yeah. So people that work in many-valued logic find it quite natural to work with MV algebras. So there are many uh, results uh, in logic that... It, since there is also a link with sister algebras. Yes, and also from uh, a universal algebraic point of view, the theory of MV algebras is algebraic. So it, you can apply all results from a universal algebra to that context, which you cannot do for uh, L groups with strong unit. On the other hand, since you have uh, no torsion, you can uh, calculate much better with the L groups. So you see, these are very interesting dualities because certain things are more natural from, one, mm, from the point of view of one side and others from another. So it is a very beautiful duality and uh, equivalence. And uh, so mm, it was a nice opportunity for us uh, to test the, mm, the bridge um, technique. And in fact, uh, I <laughs> we were able to establish uh, some um, surprising results uh, thanks to these uh, bridges. For instance, here is, uh, you see some of uh, the things we have uh, obtained. So I have already mentioned the, the correspondence between the quotients of the two theories, but we were also able to transfer some logical properties from the theory of MV algebras to that of uh, uh, LU groups, uh, which were unexpected. For instance, uh, some, uh, it's written there, form of compactness and uh, complete uh, completeness with respect to the set-based models. The fact uh, that uh, a certain sequence uh, which is uh, satisfied in all set-based models is provable in a theory. You know that when uh, you have a theory which is infinitary, in general, this uh, is not the case. So there are examples of infinitary theories that don't uh, satisfy this result. For finitary theories, if you assume uh, the, the axiom of choice, it is a classical uh, result by Gödel that it is the case. But you see, in the case of L you, the theory of lattice order group with a strong unit, this is infinitary, so a priori there is no reason to imagine that uh, such a completeness result would hold. But in fact it does. It does because there is a topos theoretic invariant which corresponds to that, which is the property of a topos to have enough points. And since the, the, the theory of MV algebra is finitary, then uh, uh, even without using the axiom of choice, uh, you can see, because the classifying topos is a pre-shift topos, you can see that you have this uh, form of completeness, and so you transfer on the other side. And, uh, and you can do a lot of things uh, uh, along the same lines. We also investigated many other things uh, concerning uh, NV algebras and L groups. There is another important uh, duality uh, equivalence, uh, which was discovered by Dinola Lettieri, uh, between uh, the theory of uh, so-called perfect NV algebras and the theory of lattice ordered abelian groups without the requirement of a strong unit. This is also nice uh, equivalence, which again uh, does not uh, arise from uh, a by interpretation um, in the sense that the coherent uh, syntactic categories of the two coherent means that I restrict just to the finitary geometric formulas. Instead of taking uh, all, uh, I just take the finitary. So we don't have, uh, 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 we also proved that in our paper, that we don't have uh, by interpretation at that level, 
but we can identify again through bridges three different levels of by interpretability for particular uh, classes of formulas, which I called irreducible formulas, geometric sentences, and imaginaries. So you see, the topospheretic analysis reveals many things uh, that you can imagine a specialist in that area would not even imagine thinking in this way. Yes, please. Question. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, because your argument about the non by interpretability seems to be relying on the existence of a strong M uh, unit. Uh, not really. It's, not a, it's really. a size issue. It's a size uh, so it's issue. It's not the existence of strong No. Units. The fact that these... Uh, no, in fact, uh, we gave uh, another uh, argument which is based on other okay. considerations uh, for proving the, uh, the non-by-interpretability of these uh, two theories. So depending on the cases, you the proof of that is also not hard. You ju it's a trick. You just have to play the, 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 the game uh, well enough. And um, uh, so it's not the same argument. It is another one. Um, OK. so. Anyway, again, you see that uh, topos theory suggests the kind of dictionaries that can exist. I remember that uh, when uh, we talked about uh, uh, these things with uh, Dinola, we asked him, uh, do you think there is uh, some kind of interpretation between these two theories? Because uh, what he had proved is the equivalence between the set-based, uh, the, the categories of set-based models of this theory. And he couldn't answer himself for me. I mean, uh, I just don't know. Uh, he didn't have any any clue and uh, of course uh, uh, he knew he, he suspected that there couldn't be but uh, you see what topos theory allowed us to do uh, was uh, to, to, to really systematically investigate the matter and uh, uh, pointing out the kind of translations that were possible uh, between the, the theories and then uh, um, we also got uh, other results which I don't have the time to, to go into. Uh, I would like uh, just to mention uh, another uh, set of results that we obtained in a third paper, uh, which concerns uh, local NV algebras, <laughs> and uh, also local NV algebras in a proper variety of NV algebras. This was interesting for us because, uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, unlike uh, in uh, the first uh, two papers, uh, we didn't start with uh, equivalences that were already known, but we discovered new equivalences and uh, thanks to topos theory. So topos theory guided us uh, to discover new equivalences between theories that are, uh, in fact, uh, all uh, of uh, pre-shift type. Um, I mean, the theory of uh, local NV algebras in a proper variety of NV algebras is we proved that it is a theory of pre-shift type, and we uh, described a theory extending. Uh, so we described the theory extending uh, the theory of uh, lattice ordered uh, billion groups, uh, which is uh, uh, Morita equivalent to that. And the way we arrived at that uh, is really through topos theory. So basically, we had a, 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 an indication, we had a clue that uh, uh, this theory could be of pre-shift type because uh, if you consider one particular variety of NV algebras, which is chunks variety, the local NV algebras in chunks variety are, are exactly the perfect NV algebras for which such an equivalence holds. Uh, so we, um, we started, um, I continue because it might take uh, some time. Uh, so, um, uh, so in fact, um, uh, we thought uh, maybe it should remain on, of pre-shift type even if we change the base, uh, the basic variety uh, with which we intersect the class of local NV algebras. But we faced the problem because the intuitive axiomatization that you would give, the first uh, axiomatization you, you would derive for the local NV algebras just fro from the definition, when you go and, uh, and calculate the Grothendieck topology associated to that, uh, basically uh, you, you are not able to conclude that this topos is, uh, uh, is equivalent to a pre-shift topos. So, uh, but we were nonetheless convinced <laughs> that uh, uh, this topos uh, should be of pre-shift type. Uh, and, uh, and so, okay, 
And so, uh, so basically, we, uh, we were forced, we were led to refine in a constructive way the, axiom the original axiomatization in a quite uh, sophisticated way, I mean, technically, we had to rewrite constructively this axiomatization in order for the Grothendieck topology uh, for the corresponding Grothendieck topology to become rigid. And when you have a, a, a Grothendieck topology which is rigid on a certain category, rigid means that uh, for any object uh, there is uh, a sieve, uh, a covering sieve, which is generated by arrows whose domains are uh, J-reducible objects. A J-reducible object is an object that doesn't admit any non-trivial covering sieves. So when you have a rigid topology, by the comparison lemma of Grothendieck, uh, you know that the, the, the topos is equivalent to a pre-shift topos. So you see, we were led by these rigidity considerations, which are really of topos theoretic nature, to, uh, to refine the axiomatization. And so once we did that, uh, in fact, uh, this refinement of the axiomatization was found interesting also by the specialist because it is more accurate than uh, the, the understanding that, that was available uh, before. Uh, because we really had to go in, in the concrete um, uh, uh, aspects of, uh, of, 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 the, of the theory to get that. But you see, we were led to that, and so we were able to conclude that the theory was of pre-shift type, and not only that, but we uh, were also guided, again, by topos theoretic consideration to the identification of a theory extending that of lattice order group, which would be a, a Morita equivalent to that. So these equivalences which uh, we discovered were uh, actually new, even in the set theoretic uh, setting. So you see, it's another illustration of the creative power of toposis. It's not just useful for understanding known uh, dualities and uh, discovering new results about them, but also for dis discovering new dualities. And you see that really the key element which uh, uh, guided us is a topos theoretic notion, the notion of rigidity which uh, uh, inspired us uh, and uh, indicated the way. Okay, so now I think uh, on this topic I have already said enough, so maybe I come back to my original plan, which was uh, to, uh, okay, so how much time, uh, maybe I still have uh, uh, 10 minutes, right, before the, the lunch, okay? Okay, so, um, okay, so let's talk uh, uh, five. No, 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 uh, still five minutes more. Uh, still five minutes, okay. Uh, so maybe I just uh, mention uh, quite uh, briefly uh, the fact that uh, um, topological Galois theory has, uh, uh, in the classical uh, form, has uh, a very well-known categorical reformulation, which uh, was already discovered by Grothendieck. So if you have uh, a, a Galois extension, not uh, necessarily finite dimensional, then uh, you can uh, um, express the correspondence between the intermediate uh, finite field extensions and uh, the open subgroups of the Galois group. You can express that as a categorical equivalence between uh, the category of finite intermediate extensions, uh, the opposite of that, and the category of um, uh, non-empty transitive continuous actions of uh, the uh, Galois group. Okay? So this is something um, very well known. But, uh, uh, you see, mm, when things are formulated in this way, uh, the question uh, naturally arises uh, whether we can uh, characterize uh, the categories whose dual, uh, whose opposite are equivalent to categories of the same form, where instead of taking the Galois group, uh, we would like to have uh, a notomorphism group of some object which uh, should play the role of the Galois extension. Okay? So we wonder about that. Observation, we go to the topos level. So this might seem crazy because if uh, you see uh, you, you, you have an equivalence holding at the level of sites, why should you? It's like uh, you have already a dictionary, so there is no point <laughs> to going to toposes. But, the, but in fact, uh, it was not a crazy idea because in that case, uh, this is a situation where you have an equivalence of toposes which restricts to an equivalence of sites. But, in fact, there are a lot of Galois-type equivalences holding at the topos theoretic level which do not restrict 
to equivalences of sites. So it means that when we work at the toposphoretic level, we have a lot of more flexibility, and this will allow us to generate many more examples of Galois type theories in different mathematical contexts. So you see, the, the equivalence of sites we started with can be completed, can be extended to an equivalence of toposes, where on one hand, I put the atomic topology on the opposite of the category of a finite intermediate extension. The atomic topology is defined as uh, the Grothendieck topology whose uh, covering sieves are exactly the non-empty ones. And on the other side, I have uh, the full category of actions. So I take not just uh, the transitive non-empty actions, which are in fact uh, the orbits, the atoms of this topos, I take the full topos, I take all the actions of the Galois group on uh, discrete sets, uh, all the continuous actions. So continuous means that for each point, uh, the isotropy subgroup, uh, the one uh, consisting of the elements that fix that point, uh, should be open. Okay? So uh, it's easy to see that uh, you can complete in this way. But now the point is, uh, OK, what if we want to replace our category L, F, L with uh, a possibly arbitrary category C, uh, on the opposite of which we can put the atomic topology? Under which conditions can I find an object U uh, such that uh, I get a Galois type? equivalence of this kind. Now, uh, there are some uh, key uh, properties that I have to introduce to state the result. So uh, amalgamation property, we have already talked about that yesterday. It means that any two uh, arrows with common domain can be completed to a commutative square. Joint embedding property, already we talked about uh, that yesterday in relation with the property of a topos to be uh, two valued. It means that uh, for any two objects, there exist a third and two arrows from the two objects to, to it. Okay. Then we have uh, a notion of uh, universality with respect to C for objects lying in the in the completion of C. So it's important uh, to, uh, to distinguish between uh, the original category C, which is uh, small, and the category uh, to which uh, the analog of the Galois extension should lie in. You see, if the Galois extension is infinite dimensional, it will belong to the completion of the category of finite extensions of the base field, because it can be an infinite extension, but a fin an infinite extension is always a filtered union of the finite sub-extension, so it belongs to incompletion. So we look uh, in the incompletion for objects that uh, satisfy good properties for that equivalent, for such an equivalence of toposis to old. So these are the two key uh, conditions, uh, C universality and C ultramogeneity. So C universality means that um, for any object uh, in uh, the category C, there should be an arrow from it to U. And uh, ultra-homogeneity means uh, that uh, there are enough automorphisms on uh, the object U uh, to transform uh, to each other any two arrows from a given object of C to U. Hmm? Exactly. So if you take U to be the algebraic closure, you see that uh, these properties are satisfied. And in fact, uh, the theorem says that uh, these properties are not just uh, uh, necessary, if you want, but in fact they are sufficient to have uh, an equivalence of toposes, even in cases where you don't require at all the topology to be subcanonical. So this theorem, you see, is quite neat. You don't uh, uh, require any further hypothesis on uh, the category C, just amalgamation, joint embedding, and then uh, you require um, uh, these properties on, uh, on U, and you see these properties are necessary necessary because we want uh, such an equivalence to be induced um, by the functor which assigns uh, to each object C of C the home set, uh, you see, uh, the set of uh, morphisms in the, in the completion from C to U. And we want uh, this functor F to take values in uh, the full subcategory of uh, that category on the non-empty transitive actions. Non-empty means that it should be C universal, and transitive means that uh, it should be C ultra homogeneous. Okay? 
So uh, this result, I have to say, I, uh, it's, it is completely categorical, but in fact I proved it uh, through a bridge. I proved it by, logi by using logical techniques, uh, because you see the, the difficulty uh, in proving a result of this kind, I have to admit I don't have a geometric proof of that, and I didn't even look for that because my logical proof is very, very short, it's just one page, something like that. Uh, but I don't think it would be easy to, to obtain that, uh, especially because you don't have any subcanonicity requirement. But the way I prove that is uh, to logically interpret all of that in terms of classifying toposes, and then using the syntactic site for those classifying toposes, which are subcanonical. And you see, when you have subcanonical sites, things become easier to establish. But then uh, you can come back, and I, I will say a bit more about this later when we talk about Freise, because uh, in fact the link between Galois and Freise is given by the introduction of a third point of view on this kind of topos, which is precisely the, point of the syntactic uh, point of view. And this is how the result was proved. So basically I proved it using logical techniques and then I translate it back into purely categorical uh, language. Okay, so maybe now I stop or uh, do I still have a uh, okay. uh, no, I don't have. Okay, so no problem. Uh, we uh, resume uh, later. Maybe there are some questions? Yeah. No, I have uh, two comments. Uh, so first, a comment on uh, what you just said. So if you look at the proof by uh, Grothendieck of his theorem, uh, that, uh, so he defines the notion of Galois category, yeah. and then he proves that if a category is Galois, it is equivalent yeah. to the category of uh, finite actions of the group uh -huh. of symmetries of the, 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 the functor oh, the of the fiber side of yeah. the fiber functor yeah. Uh, yeah. which is given with the category and uh, in fact uh, uh, this proof which is a proof of uh, not uh, uh, much less general result than yours uh, is uh, much longer and, uh, than uh, your proof uh, with uh, logical techniques. Yeah, yeah. So and uh, I, there are also some authors that prove a particular case yeah. of that result, yeah. uh, which uh, uh, it's a bit more general <laughs> because it concerns monoids, or, but it's very long. It's like, yeah. uh, uh, so it is a, a particular case in, in the group setting. Mm. It also includes part of monoids, but, and it's quite complicated. <laughs> I mean, it takes 50 pages. So, uh, you, 15 so pages you, may take, you may take that uh, as uh, yeah. an indication that, after all, uh, logic can be useful. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very useful, which, <laughs> very useful. Which means uh, that mathematicians uh, sometimes uh, should learn some logic. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, logicians uh, sometimes uh, should take care about applications. <laughs> yeah, I would like to say <laughs> that uh, uh, the key point here, no. you might no. think that it's uh, crazy no. to prove uh, a completely mm. categorical result like that by using logic, what is the trick? The trick is that you can regard any small category as the category of finitely presentable model of a theory of pre-shift type up to idempotent splitting completion. So, and uh, you see the category of uh, finitely presentable models for a theory of pre-shift type, as we shall see later, it's dual, uh, is equivalent uh, to a syntactic category, to a full subcategory of uh, the syntactic category of the theory. And so, you see, since it is a full subcategory, you are really in the syntactic site. Uh, this uh, site is uh, subcanonical, and you can work much more conveniently in that site uh, than uh, in an arbitrary site. So I played this game, but you can play it every, in every context, such a game, uh, because any category, if you want, you can regard it in this way. And so you pass from the language of category theory to the language of logic. And of course, it's important that you understand uh, theories of pre-shift type well enough. This is why I will talk uh, about uh, them later. You have another? Yeah, yeah. so my other comment is uh, something which came to my mind uh, when you, uh, you had uh, this uh, slice with the drawing of the real part and the imaginary part. Yeah. And uh, of course, I had seen this drawing several times, so, uh, uh, but uh, it, it came to my mind that uh, uh, it is strongly reminiscent of something which exists in classical philosophy. I mean, uh, <laughs> which begins with Aristotle. 
uh -huh. and uh, which was really central in uh, medieval philosophy uh, with uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas uh, in particular, and uh, which was uh, uh, studied again in the 20th century uh, by some people, especially in, the, in phenomenology. So this is the duality between so-called act and potential. Yeah, so yeah. in Latin, acta and potentia. And uh, so this means what really exists mm. and what can exist. Yeah, what is okay? potential and, uh, and so what is actual. Uh, I had never made this relationship. It just came to my mind. Yeah, yeah. But for so sure, the, uh, so. Uh, for me, it's, it is illustrative of the fact that uh, uh, Grotendieck has uh, made uh, incredible inventions, which most often uh, consist in uh, 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 writing uh, mathematically or uh, uh, incarnating mathematically things which in some sense are pre-mathematical. Yeah, yeah. Very basic yeah, intuitions see, the, the of the human of mind. Yeah, and yeah. so for instance this duality between mm. uh, act and potential, so what really exists and what can exist, so it is a fundamental duality of, the, of uh, human thought. It was studied as such for centuries and centuries, and it just came to my mind that uh, this duality between uh, sides and toposis, or between theories and uh, the toposis which classify them, uh, and more generally, as you said, between uh, presentations of toposis and toposis themselves, yeah. it is a mathematical incarnation of yeah. this fundamental uh, human uh, yeah. Uh, thought. Yeah, I think it's very striking the fact that uh, topos theory can materialize a lot of intuitions and things that would uh, really seem immaterial. They become material when you, like the notion of, the very notion of a point of view, you see, they, they, it encourages you as a subject to take any intuition you have very seriously. Because uh, logic is very accommodating as a subject for uh, expressing intuitions. Because logic is connected with language. Logic is like language, basically. And the point of view is a way we have to represent things. So it is a language. Basically, so uh, we have on the one hand uh, the, the logic, and on the other, uh, which is uh, something quite unstructured because a theory is just a description, is a sketch. You see, you just have a language and uh, some uh, description of your structures there, which formalizes a point of view. So it is something that for you is very easy to, to, to come up with. On the other hand, this duality that exists between geometric theories and classifying toposes allows you to maximal, uh, maximally structure this, uh, uh, this potential, which is expressed in sketchy form uh, when, you, when you give a theory. You see? So uh, it's very important uh, to work at uh, these two levels because both of them are valuable and uh, this duality is extremely rich, both conceptually and technically. Yes. <coughs> you comment uh, the full hour on two proofs of uh, equivalence of uh, topoi. Uh, uh, apparently, for me, which I, I'm not an expert, it seems that the first proof required less uh, powerful uh, implementation, for example, the logic point of view you didn't mention in the pr first proof, or perhaps I missed that, but rather in the second one is very evident. Uh, that uh, you the proof of which result? Uh, this MV algebra. Ah, the MV algebra, yes, no, because it was just, uh, I mean, it was a routine in a sense, for the first two papers, to lift these equivalences. Yes. And you said the there was a trick in particular. I understood that there yeah, is a topological um, trick that you mentioned, but you yeah. seem to have in mind a second point which was fundamental, impo fundamentally important in the yeah. proof of the, first, of the equivalence. Yes. Can you comment on that? Uh, the, po the point that uh, um, it, w it needed to be constructive. Okay. Yes, so because, uh, in fact, uh, people working in that community have never really paid uh, attention to constructive issues. And so, in fact, uh, we had to be quite careful on rewriting everything at the purely syntactic level because the axiom of choice was used several times by them, but it was not essential. 
So actually we had to work a little bit on that, but again it was uh, relatively straightforward. I mean if you are used to constructive mathematics, you know, you immediately understand whether... So no logic at that, uh, uh, in that proof essentially was... Uh, yeah, no, uh, we, we really had to prove some, to introduce some lemmas in order to make it fully constructive. And once we did that, uh, uh, since the construction of the functors was geometric, uh, it came just as a consequence. The meta picture is very clear. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's like, you know, you, you have the interval. Yeah, you just copy. Otherwise, you have to copy. copy yeah, them. exactly. So, so it is a collimit. So yeah. mean, one is, is very compact, and yeah. the other one is infinite by construction. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah. No, but uh, in fact, uh, the, the use of the axiom of choice uh, were really unnecessary, so, yeah. Other questions?